want to give you some context to what I think God has done for us in worship this morning because I want you to go home knowing that today marked a time when things became different. So you look back in our own history and in the mid-1800s we declared there were no longer any slaves in America. We fought a war over that, killed more of each other than would have ever died in any other war over the issue of whether or not someone could own someone else. It was a hundred years later when we passed civil rights legislation. We shouldn't have had to have done that. We answered those questions a hundred years earlier. Amen. But a hundred years later, there were people who still fought like slaves and there were people who still fought like slave owners. And so we had to fight a legislative battle to make reality what we had fought for back here. I need you to know that what happened this morning in your life wasn't when it started. It started at the cross and resurrection. That's when you were set free. When you first trusted in Jesus, that's when you were set free. The problem is some of us were set free back here, and years later we're still thinking like we're still a slave to fear. We're still acting like. And I will tell you that there are demons who will act like slave owners in your life if you let them. And at some point you say, I'm going to that school. I'm sitting at that lunch counter. I'm going to ride on that bus seat right here in the front, not in the back. At some point you decide not to think like a slave anymore and say, that seat's for me. That lunch counter's for me. That school's for me. That piece of property's for me because I am no longer a slave. Today was not about cross and resurrection. It was much more about civil rights legislation. It was about you not thinking like a slave anymore. God already set you free. You have to decide how you're going to think about yourself. Because we can declare you legally free forever. And as long as you think like you are in bondage to fear or anxiety or anger or addiction, as long as you think that way, our declaring you free doesn't make any difference because you continue to live as if you weren't free until you say, no, no, God set me free. So I'll sit in the front of the bus. I'll sit at that lunch counter. I'll use that restroom. I will register to vote, I, whatever, you get the analogy, right? At some point, you walk into a situation and say, I'm not that person. I'm not going to behave like that anymore, and I'm not going to let you treat me like that anymore. That's what today was about. So, Father, I pray for the ability to be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may be able to prove what is the good and acceptable will of the Lord. I pray, Father, for that freedom. You already set us free, but I pray for the ability to think like a person who is free, to think like a person who is not afraid, to think like a person who is not angry, to think like a person who is not addicted, to think like a person who is not perverted, to be free, to think in new ways, and to behave accordingly. Father, I pray that today would mark a day that people would go home and circle a date on a calendar and say, it started for me that day when I figured out I was actually free. Thank you, God, for setting us free and all the things you did and the incredible price you paid so that we could be free. But God, help us to live in the freedom you've given us. Help us to never live below that, to never live less than that. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Hang on to that freedom. Tell some people they're free. That'd be a good thing. <laughs>
everyone, it's me, Jamie. So our fall events are in full swing here at Parkway, and we wanna make sure that you're not missing out on something just simply because you didn't hear about it. So a couple of things to be on the lookout for this month is our gifting seminar that's coming up. Come discover who you are and what you were created to do so you can go do great things with God. Something else to be on the lookout for, our baptisms coming up on a Sunday morning later on in the month. If you're a follower of Jesus and you haven't been baptized yet, what are you waiting for? This is a perfect opportunity to make that happen. You can find out so much more about our fall events and fall groups that have already kicked off or are about ready to kick off if you just go to parkwaycc.com slash events. Hi, I'm Carissa and I brought my friends with me today to Fort Vinoy Farms so we can tell you all about our day on the farm. Wear your flannel, bring your hat, bring your pumpkin spice. Justin, I think we're lost. I've got this, we'll <laughs> find our way out. So come on out and join your church family for a lot of fun and there's gonna be free chili. And just for showing up, you can enter a drawing to win a free gift card. There's a lot to do other than hang out with us. So check out the website to look at the different activities and ticket prices. Mark your calendars, because October 13th, after service, we're going to the pumpkin patch. Hey guys, where are you going? Going to the pumpkin. Well, I guess the only thing left to say is thank you. No, really, thank you for being here with us today. If this morning is your first morning with us, be sure to stop in the lobby to pick up a gift bag that we have for you. And then stop by the welcome tent to meet one of our pastors and talk with them and even let them pray for you if you'd like. Well, let's do church. Good morning, everybody. That was a really sad good morning. Come on. Good morning, everybody. All right. So if you are a first through fifth grader or if you are a sixth through eighth grader, I'm going to welcome our kids down here and our middle schoolers to the back with Justin. We're going to have a really good morning in both elementary and middle school. So please come this morning. If you had a kiddo who's on the edge, you should just like tell them it's going to be awesome. There's probably going to be snacks. There's going to be something fun. Okay, so I wrote down on my hand everything I was supposed to say because I always forget, so you all got to help me with this. The first thing is, she said on the video, the connect cards. If you look in the pew in front of you, there's connect cards. We want to connect with you. So if you have questions about what we're doing here at Parkway, fill that out. We want to connect with you. If you have a prayer request or a praise report, we pray for those and we thank God for those every week. So please fill that out. Do we have everybody down here? All right, I'm going to pray for you guys, and then I'm going to dismiss you. So, Lord, I thank you that we have, um, we have an awesome group of kids and middle schoolers with us this morning. So, God, I just pray that you would open their ears to what you have for them and that you would, um, God, you would speak to them this, this morning. There's no junior Holy Spirit in this place. God, you are an awesome God. So I just pray that you would speak to them this morning and um, change them this morning. In your name, amen. All right, as the kids leave, I'm going to welcome down our ushers to take offering this morning. Um, if you have one of those Connect cards to fill out, this would be where you could put it with the ushers. And two more things. If you are interested in the Israel trip today after church in the fellowship hall, so everybody point that way, in the fellowship hall, there is a, like a short meeting about if you're interested in the Israel trip Go there after church. It's only going to be about 30 minutes, but if you're interested, you should definitely go. The last thing, there is a giftings class tonight. I know every single person in this room has gifts and special gifts that God's given them. So tonight at 6 p.m., be in the fellowship hall for that class. It's going to be awesome. All right, without further ado, everybody, welcome up Pastor Dennis. He's going to speak to us this morning. Yes, yeah, so this is, this is the booklet we're going to use for uh, the, uh, the spiritual gifts class, basically having to do with how God created you and what abilities and talents and skills you might have related to that. Um, so my time is free, but the people that sell these books don't sell them for free. So you've got to buy the book, but uh, you get me for free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of you are going, that's about what you're worth. So, um, but... So anyway, you got you, that, that's tonight at 6 o'clock down in the Fellowship Hall. 
And so if you'd like to come and be a part of that, we're going we're gonna to have a couple of kind of self-evaluation instruments you can use and just kind of discover how God has imprinted his image into your life and how that works and how that might interact with other people. And uh, the reality is sometimes, did you ever notice there's some people hard to get along with? And sometimes it's because God made them that way. And uh, so we want to we kind of discover some of that kind of stuff. So that's, uh, that's going to be tonight. Where we're headed this morning is we want to get to John chapter 3. Probably one of the most famous conversations in all of Scripture, John chapter 3. So while you're finding that, uh, we'll, we'll kind of pull some of our thoughts together. We want to we say congratulations to, uh, to Tom and Jan Brandis, the only two uh, Cal Bear fans in the church. Uh, Cal Bears 4-0, the only undefeated team in the Pac-12. So uh, way to go, Tom. Uh, good job. If it gets to be Oregon Cal for the uh, Pac-12 championship game down in uh, San Francisco, we should go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you should buy the tickets, but we should go. And um, <laughs> so congratulations to them. Uh, Grants Pass scored last on a game that sounded like it would just we just keep scoring forever, and if they just keep playing. So that one happened, and and Hidden Valley got North Valley this week. Yeah, that, well, yeah. See. Depending on which side of the county you live on, right? Yeah, that was either a, a good or a bad thing. But uh, anyway, that's, that's, that's how all that stuff got it going. So we've started this series, and we, we've given it the title of who, Who's God and Who Am I? And we're just trying to answer some basic questions. Uh, and, and we started this series by looking at the fact that as human beings, we were created in the image of God and as image bearers to creation. So we don't just... We don't just resemble him, but we're actually representing him to all of creation. And that, that, that's the essence of what it means to be human. That's, that's why we're different. That's, that's why we're special. Um, you're not God, but you resemble him. Good enough. <laughs> you're not God, but you resemble him. And, and your greatest fulfillment as a person is when you begin to discover the image of God in your life, that's part of what this whole gifting thing is we're going to do tonight for those of you that are interested, but it's also then how you represent God back to creation. That's how you're going to find your fulfillment. Anything less in your life is less than who God created you to be. And so we've, we've started this whole thing by just acknowledging the fact that that's who we are. Um, we are, are part of a, a, a noble race of people. We have been wonderfully made. Uh, that, that, that's why issues of like taking human life from any point from its, from its inception to its natural end, that's why that's such a big issue. That's why people get so emotional about those kinds of things. It's why abuse, it's why prejudice, it's why violence are such big issues. Why? Because anytime someone is abused or anytime someone experiences prejudice or, or that kind of violent manipulative control from someone else, it, they, they are experiencing that they are created in the image of God. That is a noble person who is experiencing those things. It's why those things are such big issues. It's why those things have to be stopped and have to be stood against because this is a noble race created in the image of God to bear not only his image in just how you look and act and behave, but to represent the very nature of God to all of creation. That's why violations against other humans are so significant and why we have to take our stand against those kinds of things. It's why God holds us accountable even if the other person gives us permission to violate them. See, in America, it is permissible by law to violate other people. There are some things we say you can't do. But there's a lot of things that we say, you know what, if they say it's okay for you to do that to them, we can't arrest you for it. And God says, you're violating a noble human being created in my image to represent me to creation. And you are violating them even if you have permission. Stop it. You see the difference? This sense of nobility, I, I think we've lost that. We've lost what it means to be truly human. And so we started this whole series just by trying to recapture that, what it means to be human. But I think, honestly, when we look around, we, we, we see a lot of things that are less than noble, don't we? <laughs> 
I mean, when you read the headlines, when you, you listen to the news, when you, when you, you know, you, you, you pick up the little news blurps off, of, off the computer, however you collect your information, you see an awful lot of people that don't seem to be acting very noble ways. They don't seem to be behaving in very godlike ways. They seem to be somehow living less than the image that was created for them. We see this other image, this image of pride, this image that self-glorifies rather than glorifies God. And we recognize that it kind of all started back in the garden. So we're going to get to John 3, but I just tell you, we're going to go through Genesis and Ezekiel and Zephaniah and Revelation to get there. I, just so you know, we're just going to wander around. But there was an angelic being who basically said, hey, I think I can elevate myself and I can be as important as the God who made me. I'm going to be as important as the God who made me. And he came to our forefathers in the Garden of Eden and he said, hey, why don't you try to elevate yourself so that you're as important as the God who made you? See, our nobility comes from reflecting the image of the God who made us. Our fall, our destruction comes when we try to be the God who made us. You see the difference? And it's kind of a subtle thing. Because Satan either wants you to think of yourself as less than the noble image of God, or he wants you in pride and arrogance to declare yourself equal to the God who made you. And the truth is suspended between those two lies. And the truth is, you have great nobility and value created in the image of God, reflecting his image, but it does not allow you to somehow say you are equal with the God who made you. And it drives you to behave not less than the noble image in which you have been created. Can you, can you grasp that? See, some of you are going, oh, my gosh, I didn't want to work this hard at church this morning. I, I was just kind of co coming, you know, hoping to just slide through, brain on neutral, you know, <laughs> walk away and go, felt good. <laughs> and here you are, you're beating on my head. Sorry. Because <laughs> how you think about yourself determines how you behave. And how you think about others determines how you treat them. Thinking correctly is part of this whole process. So, sorry. Yes, I am, I am beating on your head. <laughs> but because we believe the lie, the lie that Satan told himself, I can elevate myself and become, his, become an equal to the God who made me. And he convinced Adam and Eve that they should elevate themselves and become equal to the God who made them. Because that choice was made, humanity took on the image not of the God who made them, but of the rebellious deceiver who had deceived them. And so we see rebellion against creator. We see the glorification of ourselves at the expense of other people. We continue to suffer the consequences of being out of alignment with God and out of alignment with our own creation, and we fail to thrive. The consequences were so great that the creation we were responsible for taking care of also was cast into despair. And I want to just I want to just hang on to some images that come out of scripture in regards to our environment to give you an idea of just how badly we messed up. Now, if you don't want to feel bad about yourself, blame it on Adam and Eve. But you inherited from them <laughs> some bad stuff. But what they did affected our creation. So it's how do we fix this? How do we, how do we get back to that? Andy did a good job of, of kind of starting this whole thing, just reminding us of our value and our dignity as humans. But we want to look today at what does it take to fix that. And, and as I said, sometimes we forget what we lost. We forget how bad sin really is. We forget how bad we really need saving. And when this creation fell along with us, it gave us this situation where what we have left around us is the remnant of what God created. I, 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 and I hear people, you talk about, well, I, you know, I just go out in the woods and I just commune with God, you know? What you're communing with are leftovers. You're, you're communing with what survived after something horrible happened. And, and I, I, I get it. How, how many of you like 
cold pizza. You like pizza left over the next day. Come on, be brave. Be brave. You like that? Here's the deal. We live in an environment that has fallen. We are eating cold leftover pizza every day. The air we breathe, the mountains we see, the trees we experience, the aromas that we smell, the beauty of the flowers that we see, all of that is cold leftover pizza. And if all you've ever had is cold leftover pizza, you don't know that hot, fresh pizza is way better. You don't know that if you've never had it. And unfortunately, there's not a person on this planet who has any idea of how amazing this planet was before Adam and Eve chose to sin. And before the judgment of God fell, not only on Adam and Eve's sin, but through all of humanity at the time of the flood. When the whole environmental system of this planet and the whole geology of the makeup of where you and I live was utterly and completely changed because of sin. We've gotten so used to the leftovers that we've forgotten that we lost the hot fresh. We lost the hot fresh. Romans tells us that this entire planet is literally groaning under the effect of human sin. And we anticipate a new heaven and a new earth that's not going to be spoiled by our sin. It's going to restore the thriving life that used to be here in the environment that we were a part of. This new environment is described in some amazing ways. Here's where we're wandering through Ezekiel and Zephaniah and some other places. It talks about a place that has living water. Not just water, but living water. It talks about trees that give fruit that not only provide energy, but actually provide healing for everybody who eats of it. You see, what we have left are edible plants that provide us nourishment, but the plants themselves decay and rot over time, just like the people who eat them. What we had before will come again, edible plants that provide not only nourishment, but healing to our bodies. For now, what we do is we try to synthesize some temporary healing properties that bring some sort of short-term relief to our bodies as they decay, relief from plants that are decaying themselves. I I'm telling you, you've got to have this kind of sci-fi mind that will allow you to break out of the reality that you know to even comprehend what the environment on this planet was like before sin destroyed it to even begin to grab a hold of what does it mean to drink living water? Not just water that doesn't make you, or that affects your thirst, but water that actually provides life. What is it like to eat fruit from a tree that not only provides nourishment, it actually brings healing to your body that is decaying? And I, and, and I know I, that there's that, that doctor guy from New York, he used to be a surgeon, he's got a TV program. What's that guy's name? Yeah, 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 yeah. That guy. He tries to tell you that things like kale will do that for you. I'm telling you, all kale will do is ruin your smoothie. That's all it's going to do. Okay? There, there is no magic healing property in kale, you know? It's the same as every other green thing that grows. It will provide you some nourishment. If you don't eat it soon enough, it will rot in your refrigerator like everything else. All we have left on this planet is food that somehow provides energy to our system. It does not provide healing, but that's not how it used to be, and that's not how it's going to be. God is going to redeem this mess that we've made. I, I, I simply reflect on those things so that we can appreciate how bad sin is. Because I think sometimes we forget. We forget what it did. It didn't just affect us. It destroyed our environment. It destroyed the life cycle of plants and animals. It ruined this place. And here we are, still hanging on, still surviving for 70, 80 years if we're lucky, Experiencing decay, that's not what was intended. That's what sin does. That's how bad it is. 
So at some point, we have to get serious about cleaning up this mess that we're in. We have to stop settling for being improved, and we have to start being utterly and completely changed at the core. We have to stop comparing ourselves to others in hopes that we can find ourselves to be better than average or at least better than that guy and earnestly desire to be who and what we were created to be in the first place. You were created to live forever. You were created to be a son or daughter of God, a prince or a princess in the kingdom of heaven. You were created in the image of the creator of the universe, and you are to reflect his goodness and greatness to everyone and everything you come in contact with. You have an incredible destiny and nobility in God, and sin screwed that up, and we need to be changed, utterly changed from the effects of sin, not just better than the guy next to us. We need to get that back. We need a complete do-over. So we come to John chapter 3, the most famous conversation in all the Bible. It starts off, it says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling culture. I want to stop there. We're just going to walk through this conversation because sometimes we just walk through it and we get to John 3.16 and we go, that's the verse. But we need to hang on to this. This guy is a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus who is a part of the ruling council of the nation of Israel. You and I live in a culture that prides itself on being spiritual. How many conversations do we hear about people being spiritual? Well, I said this spiritual experience. So they go to the Brit Festival, they have a couple glasses of wine, they eat a little bit of cheese, the orchestra plays in tune, and they go, it was such a spiritual event. Now, I will give you that it is an emotional thing and that music is a powerful thing and it touches us in deep places. And if you've never actually heard an orchestra that plays in tune, you might want to buy a ticket and go to the Brit Festival once in a while and hear some good music. It would be good for you. It will not change you. You will just as much be a sinner when you walk out of that event as you were when you walked into it. In fact, you might be an inebriated sinner as you walk out of that event. Because you finished the whole bottle while you were there having your spiritual experience. All I'm saying is it's a wonderful thing. It's a great thing. Music is a wonderful thing. It will not change you. It is not a spiritual experience. We live in a culture and society that is constantly defining itself and constantly applauding people who are being spiritual. Basically what we are applauding is people who are being emotional. They are not being changed. They are simply experiencing things. Or we are very proud of those people who come up with this long list of rules about how they're going to live, and they say, well, I'm just trying to be the best person that I can be, the best version of myself, and so I've decided that I'm going to be a vegan and I'm going to eat free-range. What's a free-range chicken anyway? (laughs) You know, is he just running around out there someplace? I mean, some of us are merciful enough to eat the poor chickens that are raised in cages. We did them a favor. We got them out of their cage. (laughs) You nasty, free-range people are killing chickens that are having fun. (laughs) They're free-ranging. They're running around. They're having the time of their life. And then you eat them. There's... Poor chickens in cages, they need to be eaten. They live a horrible life anyway. Do them a favor, you know. People come up with all this stuff. I'm just going to be the best version of myself. And so I've come up with all these eating rules. I've come up with all these sleeping rules. I've come up with all of these social rules and these medicines and this herbal that's and this other thing. And I exercise this much. And they build their life. And I'm just being the best spiritual person that I can be. There's nothing spiritual about any of that stuff. That's just a person who thinks they're better than the rest of us because they've come up with a list of rules that the rest of us can't follow or don't want to follow, and then they go, look how superior I am to the people around me because of all of the rules that I follow. I need you to know that Jesus is talking to a guy who lives by the strictest code of rules that any group of people have ever tried to live by on this planet. 
And he is so good at living by those rules. He is so good at being spiritual that he's got elected to a group of people that, of which there are only 70 in the entire world because he's such a good rule follower. He's that spiritual. Some of you think you did God a favor because you threw him 10 bucks in the offering this morning. This guy would take all of his spices, those little tiny seeds, and he would count them out and give every tenth one to God. This is a guy who would only walk a certain number of steps on a Sabbath day because he was being spiritual. Jesus is talking to a Pharisee who is one of the 70 best spiritual rule keepers in the world. So what Jesus is about to say applies to a culture like ours that has all kinds of ideas about what it means to be spiritual. All kinds of rules and regulations and philosophies and ideas. Jesus is going to say some things that I think apply to us. It says he came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi, we, who we, the 70 guys, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you were doing if God were not with him. Even Nicodemus knows he's about to enter into a conversation with the divine. I need you to hear this morning, Jesus' words are not suggestions. They are not one more in a series of human conversations about what it means to be spiritual, about how we can save ourselves, or at least how we can redefine ourselves so that we look better than the messed up people around us. And Jesus says to him, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Wow. Nothing less than a total restart. However spiritual you think you've been by keeping rules, Nicodemus has done better. However spiritual you think you are because of your cultural heritage, I was born into this family and these people, regardless of any of that stuff, Nicodemus has got you beat. And Jesus is looking at Nicodemus and he's telling Nicodemus, unless there is a complete and other restart of your life, you are never going to get into the kingdom of God. Wow. Wow. You have to be born again. And the environment that you're a part of has to be completely recreated. And Nicodemus asks a rather legitimate question. Though it sounds kind of silly to us because we know kind of the end of the story and what Jesus meant and all the rest of it. But Nicodemus looks at Jesus and says, are you kidding? How can someone be born when they are old? Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. You can't do this again. You can't back up and start over. You can't go back and say, well, apparently the reason I'm not in the kingdom of God, I wasn't born into the right family, so let me pick a new mom and go get tried over. <laughs> that isn't going to happen. <laughs> Even if you think it's a good idea, she doesn't. I mean, it's not, it's not going to happen. You can't go do this thing over. And Nicodemus has this understanding that spirituality is connected to what you do on the outside. It's what family you're born in. It's what rules you follow. And he's going, I can't start over like that. There's no way to do that. I mean, do you ever wonder why the, the, the Jewish people were so interested in genealogies? You ever, read, you ever read the genealogies in Scripture? Some of you, that's the part you skip, right? Get to that, oh, somebody begat. I don't even know what it means to begat somebody, but uh, okay, here we go. Four pages later, we'll pick the story up again. Why, why are those genealogies so important to the Jewish people? They misunderstood the fact that just because you're related to the Messiah doesn't mean you've been saved by the Messiah. God chose them as a group of people from which the Messiah would be born. But they needed the work of the Messiah just as much as everybody else. And they said, because I'm related to the Messiah, I'm in. You go, no. 
You're only in if you're born again by the sacrifice of the Messiah, even though you're related to him. And by the way, everybody that's born again is related to him. They lost sight of that. I, 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 will, I will tell you that sometimes we lose sight of that and think that by hanging out with people who have been born again, that it somehow makes us born again. I think I was a kid when I first heard that going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. <laughs> you can hang around there all day long. And you're still not a hamburger. You may come home smelling like the grease they use for the french fries, but you're not a french fry. You just smell like that. And I simply offer that to say that when you look at your life and go, well, I'm, I'm different now. I didn't used to hang out at church, and I go once in a while. That's like saying, I'm a hamburger because I now hang out at McDonald's. It doesn't work. And to say, I didn't used to have any Christian friends, but I've made some new friends, and I hang around with these people, and they're different. So I'm different because I'm with them now. Proximity is not what we're talking about. Because Nicodemus was as close to the truth as you could get, and he still missed it. For him to even be a Pharisee, he had to have memorized the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, including the genealogies that you skipped when you read it. He had to memorize it word for word. That was a minimum requirement to be a Pharisee. That's pretty close to the truth. And Jesus is pointing at this guy saying, dude, you need to be born again. You're still not close enough to the truth. There's got to be a complete and utter change in your life. So Jesus says, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. The spirit gives birth to the spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound. You cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Here is Jesus just moving in in his conversation with Nicodemus. He's saying, Nicodemus, we're talking about spiritual things, not physical things. Nicodemus, I don't care that your great, 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 great grandfather was Abraham. That doesn't make any difference what physical family you were born in. I don't care that you've memorized the first five books of the Bible. That doesn't make you born again. That doesn't change who you are. It gives you a lot of information, but it doesn't change who you are. Hear what I'm saying. Information is important and good. We talked about that this morning during our worship time. If you don't change the way you think, you will not change the way you behave. Information is important to us as believers. But I'm telling you, you will never think your way into becoming a Christian. You have to be born again. You will never keep enough rules to become a Christian. You have to be born again. And I don't care what your lineage is or your heritage is or who your great, great, great whatever ancestor was, either good or bad, makes no difference. You have to be born again. That's the only way we can fix this mess we made that not only messed us up, it messed up everybody else around us and it messed up the trees and it messed up the water and it messed up the bushes and the flowers and the birds and the dogs and the cats. It screwed it all up. And the only hope is that we would be born again and that we, the image bearers of God, would begin to reflect him back to our creation and that God himself will come and create a new heaven and a new earth that is no longer stained and tainted by the sin of humanity. That's the only hope for this thing. You have to be born again, and it's a spiritual thing. 
He said, Nicodemus, it's like the wind. You know the wind is real. You just don't know where it came from, and you don't know where it's going. He said, the things of the Spirit are the same way. You know they're real. You're just not sure where they came from because you can't point to a genealogy. You can't point to an outline. The Spirit just moves where the Spirit wants to go. He said, Nicodemus, you have to be born again. A person who's no longer ruled by physical passions and desires. And everybody has physical passions and desires, right? Some of you have the physical passion that I would hurry up and get this over with. (laughs) Everybody has physical desires and passions. That we would be changed so that we no longer reflect the image of rebellion, but we reflect the image of the Creator. And that we go around living as people who are humble, life-affirming, reflecting the image of our God. A new birth. And all of that then leads to the most famous verse in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God saw the mess we made and he sent the answer. That's why Jesus came. That's why he died. That's why he was resurrected on the third day. It was because God was fixing the mess we made. And it started that day at resurrection when life overcame death. Because the world you and I live in, death always overcomes life. I don't care how vital that plant is, it dies. I don't care how noble that tree is, it dies. I don't care how much you love that pet, it dies. We live in an environment where death overcomes life. Jesus walked into that environment and life overcame death. And he said, you can be born again. You can be born out of that system of decay into a system of life. And Paul says, here's how it works. Even though we are perishing outwardly, And some of you I'm looking at have lived long enough to know that you are perishing outwardly. Some of you are still under the illusion that you are not perishing and that you're doing well. I went hunting with a couple of buddies the last couple of weeks. We just walked through the woods, looked at the animals and trees and came home. (laughs) But we enjoyed the remnants of God's creation. One of the things that we discovered was that we were dying outwardly. (laughs) Even though inwardly we were renewed day by day through the Spirit of God. I believe in God more than when I left, but I have discovered some places on this planet I will never ever try to walk into again. (laughs) I can look at them from a distance and say crazy people go down into that canyon, but not men of age and wisdom like myself. For though I am being renewed inwardly day by day, I am outwardly perishing. And my legs and my back proved that to me before I got home. Paul says we are being born out of something that is decaying into something that is living. And it's not happening to us physically, it's happening to us spiritually. And when the work of that spirit is complete, I will also be physically renewed with a new body in a new heaven and a new earth because I have been born again. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him, whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Paul writes it this way. What does scripture say? It says that the word is near you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart. That is this message concerning the faith we proclaim. If you would declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you would believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and that you are saved. I will tell you, today is a good day to be born again. Today is a good day to be born again. Some of you were born again a long time ago. 
and you know what it is like to believe in God more sincerely than you did yesterday, but also hurt when you get out of bed more than you did yesterday. You understand exactly what the Apostle Paul was saying when he said, I am being inwardly renewed, though I am physically experiencing decay. Some of you know that truth. You've been born again that long, and you've lived that long. Some of you are hoping to be born again by proximity. Hey, I didn't used to go to church. Now I hang out at church. Good for you. That's a good thing to do. It doesn't cause you to be born again. I used to be all messed up, and I used to do this, and I do that, and I was addicted to this other thing, and I, I used to behave in these ways, and I've worked real hard to become a better person. Good for you. You still need to be born again. I used to be an addict, and I gutted it out, and I got sober. Good for you. You still need to be born again. You still need to be born again. Nicodemus was better at being this church-going religious guy than any of us would ever be. And Jesus told him, you've got to be born again. Every one of us in this room has got to be born again. That's the only way this thing can happen. Musicians are going to come back, and we're going to go back to that song, I'm No Longer a Slave to Fear. Fear or sin or addiction or pills or sex or whatever you're addicted to, I am no longer a slave to fill in the blank. Why? Because I've been born again. Because I've been born again. At the end of that song, Pastor Seth's going to give us an opportunity for you to make that decision, to believe in your heart and to confess with your mouth. To believe that what Jesus did was enough to fix the mess we made. He's even gonna, he's even gonna heal the flowers. He's even gonna heal the flowers. But he's mostly concerned about saving you from you so that you can be born again. God so loved the world. Today's a good day. Today's a good day to be born again. Stand with me, would you, as we sing this song. Seth's going to come and conclude. I've promised to say, if, hey, if you're new, I'm going to meet you out front and so that you can stop by and say hi. So I'm going to go do what I promised to do. Seth's going to come and conclude our time together this morning. Thanks, Seth. song in a little bit, but as I was praying for um, this service this week, I really felt um, a spirit for our church that our church is burdened by, and uh, we sang that song about being God's child, and um, a lot of times when we sing songs like that or we think of, we're, we're a child of God, we think of our earthly fathers and our earthly mothers, and we think that's what our relationship with God should be like. And some of us walk with a burden of, of feeling like they need to perform for their, for their parents. If you've ever grown up in a family like that where performance is, it's all about your performance, it's all about what you do, and you live with that burden constantly of, will I ever me measure up? Will I ever fit in? Will they ever be pleased with me? And yet Paul talks about in Philippians 3, Paul says, but whatever were gains for me, I consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through Christ, faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power, the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. 
Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ has taken hold for me, took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on to, toward the goal to win the prize for which Christ has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And I just felt the spirit over our church of, of you, you've come to church and, and you've maybe been involved in church your whole life, but there's this burden on you of I'm never going to be good enough. And that's true. That's true. You are never going to be good enough. And that's okay. Because Christ took that burden off you. He said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. I'm going to take that on. You don't have to follow all the rules. You don't have to, you don't have to live to please me. I'm already pleasing you. You are my masterpiece. I created you. So I just ask you to bow your heads with me. And I, I really felt like there was a couple people that you're really living to please and you're really striving to please. And God wants you to know that he is already pleased in you. You are his masterpiece. You are his masterpiece. And you don't have to do anything to please him. His arms are open. The mighty one is open. So if that's you, could you just raise your hand? And we're just going to pray for you. The church, all of us are going to pray for you. Yes, 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 yes. God, I thank you so much for your word. God, I thank you so much for your transformation. God, you're not just a God who wants us to come and do religious things, God, but you transform lives, God, by the power of your spirit, God. So we invite you to come invade our hearts, God. Come invade our minds. Lord, come change our hearts, God. You can melt hearts of stone. God, you make everything new, God. Like your word says in Romans chapter 12, God, you transform us. God, you don't just make us better. You don't just make us better. You transform us. You, you bring a metamorphosis of our spirit. God, you make us new creations. God, I pray that, that we as a church, God, the people that are raising their hands, God, that they would, they would strive to know you. They would strive to know you, God, and they would be transformed by you. They would not just try to, to, to put things on the outside and try to look good and try to please God, but they would just lay that down at your feet. And I'd like to pray for people, if you could keep your eyes closed, who have never come to meet Jesus. Maybe you walked in here for the first time. Maybe you've been going here for a while and you could say, you know, I did the church thing for a while when I, was, when I was younger and it didn't really affect my life. But you've lived your life and you found out that what you were pursuing did not work. And you're here in a desperate situation and you need something to come and change you. I want to give you the opportunity to make a commitment to say, God, I want you to come and change my world. Maybe not my circumstances, but change me. I want to be changed. I want to be like the people that I'm seeing. I want to be like you. I want to give you an opportunity to make that commitment. So if you, if you want to make a commitment to Christ for the first time and say, God, I want to follow you. Jesus, I want to follow you for the first time. Could you just raise your hand? Awesome. Awesome. So good. God, we thank you for the two people that committed their lives to you this morning. Yes, Jesus. God, we thank you for your transforming power, Lord God. God, we thank you, God, that you come and change lives. 
God, so we invite you to, to invade their hearts, invade their minds, invade their souls, God. God, make them in who you want to them to be, Lord Jesus. God, we just thank you for your transforming power. And church, we're going to pray this together. We're going to pray with these two people, and I would just ask you to repeat it after me out loud. God in heaven, I thank you for sending your son to die on the cross so that I could have life and life abundantly. God, I commit my life to you. And I pray that you would transform my heart and my mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for coming, guys. It's awesome. See you next week.